first reading comes from Colossians chapter 1, reading from verse 15, and you can find it in the Pew Bibles, page 1182. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. The second reading is from John chapter 1. And you can find it in the Pew Bibles, page 1063. Reading from verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. 
Well, that was, oh, well, there we are. There, you're all asleep already, aren't you? My goodness. Okay, I, I won't do the classic preacher's trick of saying, come on now, let's save. I won't do that. But there we are. I want to do an experiment with you this morning. Here we go. I have an Auntie Doreen. Okay, right. How many of you think, by a quick show of hands, how many of you think my Auntie Doreen is taller than average? Come on, one, two, three, four, five, okay, six or seven, okay. How many of you think she's actually shorter than average? One, two, three, oh, a few more, that's interesting, that's amazing. What are you, how many think she's about average height? Okay, fewer of you, yes. And how many of you think she doesn't actually exist at all? One, two, okay, okay. Well, well, what if I said to you, isn't it wonderful, you're all right? You'd think, what an idiot. And you'd be right. You see, in fact, my Auntie Doreen does exist, and she's actually taller than average. But, but how would you know whether that was true or not? What would be the best thing that could happen this morning for you to know that my Auntie Doreen exists and that she's taller than average? She walks, imagine if Auntie Dor. don't worry, she's not going to, I haven't, this is not a setup. She lives in Derbyshire, she'd be really annoyed with me, but there we are. Imagine if my Auntie Doreen came in and said, hello, Nigel, and you noticed, you saw that she was taller than usual. You see, the way to know if someone is who they say they are, to see someone's character, their attributes, well, it's to actually see them to have them reveal themselves to you, or indeed talk to someone trustworthy who was an eyewitness to that re revelation. You see, the title of today's sermon is, How Can We Know the God We Can't See? And I think that's a fantastic question. For this day and age, it's a massive question. And if we only had the first part of verse 18 to go on, we would think, that John completely agrees, and we're all lost, because he writes this. He says in the beginning of chapter, verse 18, if you've got it in front of you, no one has ever seen God. Comma. Thank God for that comma. And we'll come to see what comes after the comma in a minute. But first, considering that this is the first of a series in the Gospel of John, I wanted to give the briefest of introductions. Normally I spend ages on introductions. I love context and history, but I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna calm down. I just wanna give a very brief introduction. Here we go, the strangely enough, the Gospel of John was written by John. There's, no, there's almost no doubt about that, which is great, because most times people will stand here and say, it could've been John, could've been Philip, could've been Bob, could've been Jim, but no, it was John the disciple John, not to be confused with the other John that people talk about a lot, and in fact in this passage we heard about, John the Baptist. Now note, the disciple John, what's strange about this, in the Gospel of John, he is not mentioned once. He's never mentioned. But apparently that was really common. I mean, if I wrote something something about Nigel, my goodness, I'd mention Nigel all the time because I'm like that, ask my wife. But, but in those days, if you wrote something, you didn't name yourself in your writing. And if you remember, he alluded to himself rather, five times in this gospel, he alludes to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now I've always thought that's a bit pompous, but maybe I'm being heretical there, but there we are. But, but I don't think he was being pompous, you see. I don't think he meant the disciple whom Jesus loved, as a, and it meaning that Jesus didn't love the other disciples. I think it was, and I hope we will see this today, that John was constantly, and remember he's writing this as an old man, he was constantly surprised, not just that he was loved at all, but who it was who loved him. And John says of his own gospel in 21 verse 25, Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. So make a note of this. John's gospel was not meant to be a meticulous list of every single detail of Jesus' life. 
Rather, as he, as he says in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, he says these words, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. So that's reiterating what he said earlier. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that means chosen one, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Again, the Gospel of John was not written to simply supply a historical record of Jesus' every move. More importantly, it was written so that its readers in the first century and the second century and the third century, this could take me a while, so I'll just skip, and the 21st century would do what? Believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that by believing may have life in his name. And so this morning, if you're not sure about Auntie Dora, no, if you're not sure about God and what he is like and how you can come to know him, then John is speaking to you this morning. Everyone else can just eavesdrop, that's fine, but they're not the intended recipients. The person this morning who's not sure they are the recipient. So back to verse 18. Let's see what comes after that comma. No one has ever seen God, comma, but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. And so we come to the reason again for John's writing. It was to do with revelation. Or to be more specific, a particular revelation. The reason we have John's gospel is because Jesus revealed God. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is in the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. So here John is acknowledging that no one has ever seen God. In fact, if they had, they wouldn't be around to tell us. They wouldn't have survived the experience. But John is saying that Jesus, who is God himself, became a man. In fact, in a couple of months, we'll celebrate that, won't we? We'll celebrate the fact that God came in human form about four pounds. Three and a half pounds, four and a half pounds, we don't know. Born to a teenage girl in a dirty stable in a backwater of the Roman Empire. And John is maintaining that this Jesus revealed God to humankind. And what's more amazing is that this morning, and the readers, whenever they have read this, we have a choice that we have to make. Either you, on upon, upon hearing who this Jesus was and is, and knowing from other events from this and other Gospels, upon hearing what this Jesus did, either you accept that he was the true revelation of God and fall down and worship, or you reject him. But let me set out what John sets out here in support of that statement in, chapter, in verse 18. Verse 1, here we go. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now John deliberately starts his gospel with the words, in the beginning. Does that ring a bell with anyone? Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John purposefully wants his readers to make the link between the creator God and who he is about to introduce. And he calls him the word. Now that sounds strange. Now these days, it's what trendy people say to each other, you know, word. And when I do that, my my children cringe. If they ever watch this on YouTube, they'll go, not again, dad, you've embarrassed yourself. Well, that's not what John meant, you see. What he meant was that the one he was introducing here was God's word. 
You see, back then, the Greek word logos, which is the word used here for word, was the spoken word and the as yet unspoken word. It was the essence of the character of a person. The word you spoke and the word that had yet remained unspoken represented you, your character, your nature, your essence. And that's why John is saying that Jesus was that word and he was the revelation of God himself. And then verse 3 further presses this home, doesn't it? Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that, had been, that has been made. Can you see what John is saying here? So there's no doubt. He's equating this word with God. And he does so by ascribing creation to this word, to Jesus. And did you notice the lovely way he did it? We as humans, we love loopholes, don't we? Through him all things were made. Ah, but did he make chickens? Ah, but wait. Without him nothing was made that has been made. Make no doubt. Don't try and get around this. Jesus made everything. He is tantamount to the creator God. And then Jesus goes on, John goes on to give Jesus two other attributes, which are amazing. Life and light. In verse 4 and 5, it says this, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. These are bold claims. Sorry, in one sense, these were crazy claims. John was talking about a carpenter's son from Nazareth. And he doesn't say he brought life or he lived. It says in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. And John, even though he had seen such terrible things, his brother James killed very early on. Many others of those he loved, imprisoned, persecuted, killed. He could say that the darkness had not overcome this revelation of God in Jesus. God's word, God's life, God's light. Jesus was God's revelation. And then John then references John the Baptist, how he testified that Jesus was the light. And we jump to verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. That's when John the Baptist was prophesying. And again, if we jump to verse 14, John makes one of the most beautiful statements anywhere in the Bible. I think it's the best 10 words that describe Christmas. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Isn't that wonderful? You see, made his dwelling sounds very posh, doesn't it? Sounds like he put up a villa next to him. So it doesn't mean that. The word is tabernacled. He pitched his tent among us. Can you feel the excitement in John's voice? I wonder whether the original manuscript just juddered a bit there and he got a, he got a bit excited there. His pen was wobbling as he wrote, God set up camp next to me. Isn't that wonderful? And we mustn't forget this was a man who was a very young man when he first met Jesus. He lived with him, ate with him, slept probably in the same room as him, walked around the Judean desert, with him, saw how he treated prostitutes, saw how he treated Samaritans, saw how he te treated the teachers of the law, and he had to become children of God. Mind boggling. You should be falling off your seat. What do you mean that I can become a child of God? Don't ask me, that's what it says here. God's true revelation, the word, the life, the light. He gave them, John, Peter, Matthew. He gives us, me, John, T, Anna, the right to become children of God. 
Now, if that doesn't blow you away, I'm not sure anything will. We are children of God. Now, John also wrote three letters that are part of the New Testament. And imaginatively enough, we've called them 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. Now, I'm going to read the first three verses of his first letter. This is not the Gospel of John. This is later on in the New Testament, 1 John. So it's 1 John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. And this was on the email that Jonty sent out during the week. He didn't know I was including this. That which was from the beginning. Note, note, note the echoes of his gospel. That which was from the beginning, beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. So my prayer this morning is that we will indeed have fellowship with. We will indeed go camping with. We'll pitch our tent. We'll dwell, whatever you want to call it. I pray that we will meet God through Jesus this morning, either afresh or for the very first time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful passage. Thank you for John. Thank you for his enthusiasm as he writes. When he looks back and remembers those days when Jesus walked side by side with him. And thank you that we have an eyewitness. And Lord, thank you that you are the same God who for some reason wants to commune with us, wants to pitch his tent with us. Help us this morning to fall down and worship in Jesus name. Amen.